Life Fellowship Church once again is coming to you by video. Uh, I read the instructions from our governor on uh, churches could commence if they kept these guidelines and well the guidelines are probably real wisdom from the standpoint of the medical community for a church they're impossible. Uh, our instrument players can't play instruments with their masks on. Our singers can't sing with a mask on. I can't lead with the mask on. And I can't certainly speak to you out of the Word of God with the mask on. So this is the best we can do for the moment. So keep us prayed up and keep yourself prayed up because there are a lot of people in the nation right now that are suffering and desperate. We praise God we're not. Hallelujah. And so, God bless you. It's good to be with you again. And anyone who's watching, you're most welcome to watch. Uh, what I'd like to talk to you about today <clears throat> is very simply this. The patterns in the Bible begin in the Old Testament, and they come to their fruition in the New. And so, uh, I would like to talk to you about patterns and instructions. The patterns are instructions and they're very important. And you need to realize what God established in the Old Testament what will be played out in the New. And so today the premise is very simply this. You all recall we uh, in the school taught on the tabernacle in the wilderness. And so I'm going to invite you to go to the 25th chapter of Exodus and let's begin there where Moses restreat, we received instruction from the Spirit of God, from God himself, on about the construction of that tabernacle and all the things that pertain to it. <coughs> I hope you'll remember in uh, the, the teaching we did, uh, oh, we do every uh, cycle of school, and most of you are, have been through the school, but you remember the tabernacle in the wilderness was a complete conglomeration of things that all had meaning and so we're going to just deal with one part of that meaning today, and that's how they relate to the New Testament Christian. So in Exodus chapter 25, I want to uh, just begin here in, and, and let, me, let me just begin with verse 1. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, they bring me an offering. Of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart, you shall take my offering. Now, what he's going to ask for in this offering is what they came out of Egypt with, because these are the people who the Lord brought into freedom under Moses when they came out of Egypt over 400 years of slavery. And he said, see, they came out, according to the Bible, they came out having spoiled the Egyptians of gold and silver and raiment, everything they needed when they left. And there were about three million of them thereabouts. And they left Egypt rich and healed, according to Psalm 105. Now it says here that the Lord said, I want to take an offering of these. And the one you will take the offering will be gold, silver, and brass. Each of those metals have a particular meaning. Gold is the, is really the righteousness of God, holiness. It's a divine metal. Silver is the metal of redemption. Remember, Jesus was sold for 30 pieces of silver. And also brass is judgment. And he, he goes on to describe the things in the temple. And it, the reason God wants to get them to build this, and it is a building with three compartments, or we might say a three-tiered building, this three-tiered building is where God loves to live because he is comfortable in a building with three compartments. As a matter of fact, the Godhead is three compartments. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And he made man in his exact image, in his exact likeness. I'll read you to that in a moment when we go to Genesis chapter 2. But here in Exodus chapter 25, go to verse 8 with me and read this. He gave all the instructions of the materials that were going to be used in the construction of this uh, tabernacle in the wilderness, where the Jews traveled with that for over 40 years and uh, probably sometime longer. We, we don't, real, uh, don't really know, don't have enough history there to tell well, when it was uh, eliminated. But nevertheless, God said in verse 8, let them make me. He said, make me a sanctuary. 
that I may dwell among them. God's desire has always been to dwell with his people, not him in heaven and us on the earth, but to dwell within our presence and us in his presence. So he desires that. And he said, now I've given you the instruction here, Moses, and for the next few chapters of Exodus, you're going to find there's more and more and more that has to do with this tabernacle in the wilderness and how important it is and how it relates to the New Testament Christian. Uh, we will touch on basically one thing today, and that is the relationship between the tabernacle and the wilderness and the tabernacle of the human body that God has created in order to move out of that building that was separate from people and put himself into the building made without hands. That means the human body. We'll get to that in a moment. Verse 9 now, Exodus 25, verse 9. According to all that I show thee, and I want to see how many times God uses the word pattern, pattern, pattern. According to all I show thee, verse 9, after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall you make it. Now he's talking about all the furniture, and you're very familiar with that, the furniture that was in the holy place and only one piece of furniture in the holy of holies and the outer court, there's a, a, there's a brazen altar out there and that's where the sacrificial things were done by the priest. Nevertheless, he said, make sure you make this like the pattern I show you. And then he tells them in verse 39, same chapter 39, Exodus 25, 39, of a talent, that's 75 pounds of pure gold, shall thou make it in all these vessels and so he gives a whole list of things that are to be made out of the 75 pounds of gold. And then verse 40, And look thou that thou make them after the pattern, the pattern which was shown thee in the mount. So Moses received the instruction for creating a holy place where the Jews, when they come out of Egypt, would have a place to go and meet with God. Now, if you're familiar with the, the way the camp was laid out, when you've got three million people, you've got to have some order for how they camp. And so there were four banners, and these four banners had four different faces on them. And if you're familiar with it, I don't want to get into that. But once the tabernacle was established, then everybody knew what banner to create their tent under. And so everybody waited for the tabernacle to be, to be established. They were carrying it once it was fully completed. They carried it as they journeyed on their way. And when it came time for them to stop, stop God would tell them to stop. And then they would set up the tabernacle for, for service. And then the people, the three million strong, would find their place to camp under the banner of one of those four banners, north, south, east, and west, around the tabernacle. So the tabernacle was the center of life for all of the Jews. And they were at that time, they were Hebrews. And they came out of Egypt, and they came out <coughs> under the hand of God, under Moses. And they were given, first of all, an order of the camp. And this, this tabernacle was built under the pattern and the instructions of God. And it has very deep meaning, and we can't get into it. It take days to cover the reasons. It would take days to cover the reasons of the metals and what they represent and all of the different things that made up the Mishkan, which was the tabernacle. But God said, I want them to make a place for me to dwell with you. So that's been his thrust all the time. God wants a three-tiered building to dwell in. Why? Because God's number is three. And it is because of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Now, for my precious friends who, who are the oneness doctrine, that is how they establish themselves, I just have to disagree with you. The Word of God won't bear out what you're doing because Jesus said, I, when he was crucified, he said, I will go to my father. Well, if, his, if he was his father, he had nowhere to go. And he said, unless I go away, the Holy Spirit will not come. Well, the scripture tells us that Jesus was seated by the right hand of the Father in heavenly places, and the Holy Spirit was sent to him, to him 
empower the church. And so there's the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So go with me to Genesis chapter 2, and let me read you a scripture about the creation of man. And for all of those of you who have been confused over the oneness doctrine, or Jesus, and the oneness doctrine, very simply this, uh, these, this doctrine says that Jesus was the Son, Jesus was the Father, Jesus was the Holy Spirit. Well, it is not possible because Jesus said totally otherwise. Let me read this to you. In God said in chapter 2 of Genesis about his creation, and he said in verse 1 and 26, he said, Let us make man in our image after our exact likeness, and let them have dominion. Dominion means God gave away the ownership and dominion of the earth to a man called Adam. And Adam ultimately delivered it into the hands of Satan through rebellion. And so God literally got shut out of his creation except by having to work through men. Now, in uh, the situation like we're in now with the COVID-19 virus, I'm sure people who do not know the word very well would say, well, I don't know why God didn't do something about that. He could stop it. He has the ability. Well, no one doubts God's ability. <clears throat> But it's the lack of freedom that he can't do anything about the virus unless you give him permission. The reason he had to establish prayer and worship and so forth for leadership of mankind is because mankind was given total authority over the earth. That's what dominion means. Total authority. Well, when God gave it away, he can't come back in because Adam goofed up and said, now, wake up. I just changed everything. I just changed my mind. I'm not going to go through with this. So just forget it, Adam. I'm, I'm taking it back. Will it make him a liar? Make God a liar? Well, anyone that reads the word, reads the word, knows this, that the Bible says, especially in the New Testament, that Satan is the father of all liars. Now, God is not going to allow Satan to be his spiritual lead. And so he cannot change what he said. Does he have the ability to take it? Yes, he does. Does he have the freedom to do it? No, because he gave the title of earth to Adam for a 6,000-year period. So God can't move in and do what he wants to. He can only work through the human agency. That human agency is the same one the devil has to work through because the devil has not the authority either without the co uh, cooperation of mankind. Now, he can begin things, and in St. John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus said, the thief, that's the devil, has come to steal, kill, and destroy. So when you see stealing, killing, and destroying, you're looking at the devil's work, not God's. Jesus said, I've come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. When you see abundant life, when you see people prospering, when you see people healthy and healed and doing well, you're seeing the works of God manifested in flesh. Now, God, uh, he can't help people who will not let themselves be helped. He said, I give you my words, and if you'll believe my words, all things are possible to him that believes. Well, we need to believe this. And this is in Genesis chapter 2. Listen to what God did. Here's how he formed you and I, the first prototype, Adam, when he said in verse 7 of Genesis 2, the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. Well, we all know that our bodies are made of ground elements and that the scripture tells us that when our spirit is removed, the spirit man, we know the body will deteriorate and return back to dust. As a matter of fact, the Bible says, ashes to ashes and dust to dust. So, the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. That's his body. He breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. That is his spirit. God put his spirit in this man called Adam. And then the man became a living soul, a reasoning being, a reasoning being. So mankind is three parts, like God is three parts. God wants to dwell in a three-tiered building, so he wants to dwell in you, Christian. And so the reason that he sent Jesus was to reconcile himself to man through the sacrificial death of the Lord Jesus and ultimately his resurrection to carry out what he had given 
uh, us in his death, burial, and resurrection. That is a new life. That's why we have to be born again. No matter how good we may think we are or how good we are, we're just in the wrong family. You have to be born in the family of God under these conditions. And so when you are not born again, we do not belong to God, no matter how much we agree with the word, no matter how, how much we agree that, oh, yeah, I believe in Jesus. And I've heard people say, well, I believe in God. Realizing full well that the devil believes in God, but he's not going to be saved. And a lot of people twist the words of God. You don't need to do that. So man is a three-part being, just like our God is a three-part being, because God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. That means we're three. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And so mankind has to be three, and that is spirit, soul, and body. As a matter of fact, let me prove that to you. Go to First Thessalonians chapter 5, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and it's imperative we understand, when we understand the word, all the things fit. When we do not understand the word, we can be misled by silly doctrines, like, and I'm sorry to say this, but the doctrine of a Jesus-only teaching is silly. The Bible will not bear that out, so read your Bible, not your church doctrine, glory to God. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and listen to this, verse 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you, W-H-O-L-L-Y, holy, that means your entire being. And he said, I pray your whole spirit. Now the Greek word for that is pneuma, P-N-E-U-M-A. Your whole spirit and soul. The Greek word for here, soul, is not the same as spirit. It is P-S-U-C-H-E, suke. The mind, intellect, emotions, and will, and and the body be preserved blameless. The body is, of course, the outer shell. That's where we live. It's, it's the housing of God. It's our mishkin of the proper age. In this age, there was a tabernacle in the wilderness. God first introduced with a three-part because it had an outer court, the place of sacrifice. It had a holy place where the priests abide that corresponds with your intellect, your mind. And then there was a holy of holies, which corresponds with the place where God lived. That corresponds with the spirit of the born again believer. So now you are the Mishkin. You are the tabernacle of God. God moved out of the old tabernacle of the wilderness. He doesn't live in churches, doesn't live in synagogues. He doesn't live in buildings made with hands. He lives in buildings made without hands. And that is the believer. The believer has God inside him because Jesus said, my father and I will come and make our abode in you. And so today, I just want you to understand that the word of God means exactly what it says. Patterns, glory to God. Now, in chapter 26, I'm going to have to take you back over to Exodus chapter 26. I want you to see this. <coughs> and look at verse, let's see. I can get the one I want here. Yes, verse 30 of Exodus 26. I hope you got your Bible. I hope you're following me. Because if you get it out of the book, you've got it right. But if you don't get it out of the book, there's anything will fly. And we don't need that. We certainly don't need it in the body of Christ. There's enough spurious doctrines now to have ministers of the gospel who don't believe in a literal hell is, of course, the height of ignorance. Jesus spent more time preaching about teaching about hell than he did about heaven. Glory to God. Verse 30 of Exodus 26. Thou shalt rear up the tabernacle according to the fashion thereof which was showed thee in the mountain. There's that word again. According to the fashion I showed you. According to the fashion I showed you. Now the tabernacle means dwelling place. So God was saying, I want you to raise this thing up, the tabernacle in the wilderness where the Jews spent their wanderings in the, in the, you know, in their going to the land of Canaan, all the delays they went through. And they had a place of worship called the tabernacle in the wilderness. And ultimately when they did get into Israel and they had a temple, then of course the Mishkin was discarded. But nevertheless, the furniture of the Mishkin was taken into the temple in Jerusalem. I don't have time to get into that in that transition. So stay with me here 
And that is that God said in verse 30 of Exodus 26, Thou shalt rear up the tabernacle according to the fashion thereof, which was showed thee in the mount. And so it was. It was done exactly like God said. Uh, I want to show you something here in verse 33. This is about the tabernacle in the wilderness. Now look at some of the catchphrases here. And thou shalt hang up the veil under the tatches, that thou mayst bring in thither within the veil the ark of the testimony. That's the ark of the covenant. And the veil shall divide unto you between the holy place and the most holy. Now while this thing was being constructed, the, the Levitical priesthood were all working on their different parts. And God had assigned very skilled people to make the different things, the different objects, the different things of furniture that went into the Mishkin and outside the Mishkin for the brazen altar, where, altar, where the sacrifices were made, where the priests labored with the sacrifices brought in by the people. And in the, in the holy place, was a place where there was food. The bread on the shoe bread on the table, then the 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 camel, the camel light, it was not camel, it was oil, but there were seven facets. Well, those seven things are very important and they are very important to the light that we receive by the Holy Spirit. So the candle of the lampstand, what they call it, at that time, there there weren't any uh, there weren't any candles at that time because candles hadn't been invented at the time of this of this writing, and so they had the light of the Holy Spirit, and this priest ministered in there. Also, there was a place called the altar of incense where the priest would offer incense, and once a year, the high priest would have to go into the Holy of Holies and, and commune with God. Now, I want you to notice, he said, in the last part of verse 33, he made a statement. I haven't seen this before, but I see it now. And he said, the veil, now between the Holy of Holies and the holy place, that means in the Meshkin, in the building, there was an outer court, that represents the human body. There was the holy place representing the soul of man. And then there was the holy of holies representing the, the spirit of man. Now, he said, when you're building this, and he said the, the people who are going to build it were skilled builders, and they were going to build the Ark of the Covenant and cover it over with the cherubims and the, the gold. He said, you shall, the veil shall divide unto you between the holy place and the most holy, and thou shalt put the mercy seat, that's where the cherubim sit, the gold cherubim facing each other, the mercy seat upon the ark of the testimony in the most holy place, and thou shalt set the table outside the veil, that was the table of incense, and the candlestick over against the table on the, right, on the side of the tabernacle toward the south, thou shalt put the table on the north side. So what he told them to do, he said, make sure you do it according to the pattern. Well, there's several things here that I can point out to you. One of them is the veil. If you remember in the New Testament that Jesus ushered us into the kingdom of God through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. Glory to God. And so the tabernacle in the wilderness was a sign and a showing of what would take place in the New Testament. That's why we call it patterns and instructions. Glory to God. Now, it's furniture and vessels and the altars are all designed by God. Now, I showed you in the New Testament how we are a three-part creature like our God. God said, let us make man in our image after our exact likeness. So man became, God put the clay together, made him a body. He's still not alive. Then he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. That would... That would correspond with his spirit. And then man became a living soul. Now, soul is the, actually the place where decisions are made. It's the mind, intellect, emotions, and will. So you are a creature like God created. You are a spirit that has a mind, a soul, and you live in this body. And so the Mishkin was merely an illustration of what was going to come down the pike in the teaching through the New Testament and so we find it, God wants to dwell in a three-tiered building.
And you are a three-tiered building, spirit, soul, and body. Glory to God. Now I want you to go with me to St. John chapter 14. St. John chapter 14. It's, we're going to try to link this together for you with the help of God. St. John chapter 14. Now, if you listen to what this says, St. John 14, and look at verse, let's look at verse 23. Verse 23 says this, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he'll keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we, God the Father and the Son. If, the, if Jesus were the Father, he would have said, I. Here he says, My Father will love him, and we, we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Well, notice you're indwelled when you're born again. What well, you're indwelled by the Spirit of God, not the Holy Spirit. Did you notice Jesus did not include the Holy Spirit in this passage? He said, my Father and I will come and dwell in you. It's very important you see this distinction because when he said that, the Holy Spirit was omitted. Now, let me just tell you something about modern theology, and that's very simply this. You can be born again all your life. You can believe the Bible, you can, you can study it, and you can improve your soul. And James chapter 1 tells us to receive the engrafted word which is able to save or to redeem your thinking process. You have to be redeemed from wrong thinking. And so he said, receive the engrafted word which is able to save or proclaim and declare the freedom of your thinking or your soul being saved from wrong ideas, wrong thinking. But it does not address the fact that there is a Holy Spirit here. Now the Bible tells us by one spirit we are baptized or immersed into Christ. Not a baptism of water. This, this immersion does not have anything to do with water baptism. And water baptism in, in the book of uh, Peter tells us very, samely, very plainly, baptism in water is conducted by a minister. It's not conducted by the Holy Spirit. It's not conducted by God. It's conducted by a minister to a person who surrenders their outer vessel, their outer court to God. And so they are identifying in the flesh what happened in their spirit. For you died and were buried. And when Jesus was raised, you were raised with him in the economy of God. And that's all water baptism is about, except it gives you a component you didn't have before, a clear conscience toward God. So water baptism is not ineffective. It has a component to play in your re rebirth of the human spirit and your growth. And without water baptism, there will not be this change of attitude toward God in your thinking. And so water baptism is commanded by God. But the baptism in the Holy Spirit is not the same as water baptism. And when you got born again, you did not receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit. You did not receive the Holy Spirit. He worked the work of putting the Spirit of Jesus. Now, the Word of God says, We who have believed received, he sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying out about Father. Now, who is the Son? Well, that's Jesus. And so... God sent the Spirit of Jesus by the Holy Spirit into your human spirit and caused it to be reborn. Because in St. John chapter 3, Jesus said you must be reborn spiritually. You can't be reborn physically, just spiritually. And so he said, the Spirit that's born again, you don't know how, where it came from. You don't know, you can't see it but you can see the effects of it, just like wind. He said the wind would blow, it will move the sticks and leaves and so forth. You can't see wind, you can only see the effect of it. Well, you can't see a new birth, you can't see a reborn Christian's spirit, but you can see the effect of it, because an evil tree cannot bring forth good fruit, and a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. And so Jesus said it this way, by the fruit of their life, you'll know them. So the people that are born again, they'll have fruit in the kingdom of God, some more than others. 
But Jesus said that's the test. Not whether a person says, yeah, I'm born again, I'm a believer. The test is what's the fruit of your life. So check yourself out. And I think probably all of us wouldn't hurt us to take inventory once in a while about the fruit of our life. And so Jesus said, my father and I will come and make our abode with you. Now in verse 26, he picks up another narrative. Glory to God. He says this, but the comforter, now the word for comforter is paraclete. And the definition of what a paraclete does is one called alongside to help to take together, to, to, to take together with offense of, or offering against your enemies. One called alongside to take hold together with against the enemies. Glory to God. So the comforter, and it's described here in verse 26 of John 14, which is the Holy Ghost. Whom the world, who the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, bring all things to your remembrance, wheresoever I have said unto you. Well, glory to God. He talks about the Comforter, and he said he will send him. Now, it's quite obvious when Jesus was on the earth, the Holy Ghost traveled with them, and it was imperative that those who followed him, his disciples, they could do signs and wonders, not because the Holy Spirit was in them, but because he was on them. And the Old Testament tells us the Holy Spirit of God came upon the, the prophet, the priest, and the king as he would, and he left as he would, and accomplished <clears throat> what God wanted him to accomplish as he was there among these. And so John 14 said, The Father and the Son dwell with us. But the Holy Spirit is not included in that dwelling. Uh, you can be born again all your life and never baptized in the Holy Spirit. You can be born again and still go to heaven, but not be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now, there's something you're really going to miss if, if that were to happen. Now, I want you to go with me over here to, let's go to Galatians for a minute. And I want you to see, as I, as I read this to you, <clears throat> Oh, I'm in Ephesians. It'd be a good idea. Now, in Galatians 4, I told you that when you were born again, God sent forth the spirit of his Son into your heart, crying about Father, not the Holy Spirit, not the person of the Holy Spirit. There's a God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They're all one in the Godhead, but they have different functions. God the Father did not die for you in the sense that he took on the whole sin of, his whole, of, of the whole world. Jesus is the one who bore the cross. He was under the Father's direction, under his anointing, and so forth. Yes, he did. But Jesus, the man, paid the sacrifice for men. And the reason it says in St. John chapter 1 that the Word became flesh, verse 14, and dwelt among us, the reason that God had to have the Word that was preexisted with Him in glory, called the Word of God, the Word had to take on flesh and come to the earth because men in the earth were given this possession. And the only way that God could get in among men is to become a man himself in the sense of the Word of God became flesh. And Jesus, that's what he was. He was the Word of God made flesh. And he came in, he came in for 30 years, nothing spectacular happened in his life. But then at the 30-year age, when he could be ordained as a rabbi, then something drastically changed. And the arrival of the Holy Spirit was a very drastic thing. Now, if you go with me to Galatians 4 again, and in verse 4, Galatians 4, verse 4, look what it says. When the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law. Verse 5, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Verse 6, because you are sons. You know, you ought to celebrate that. Thank God I'm a son of God. No longer a son of the devil. You can only have one or, you know, there's only two spiritual fathers. It's either God or the devil. If you don't belong to one, you belong to the other one. Automatic. Glory to God. 
to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Verse 6, and because ye are sons, God sent forth the spirit of his son. Now, who is that? It's Jesus. Uh, into your hearts crying of our Father. Therefore, thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then the heir of God through Christ. And so it is the spirit of Jesus you received in the new birth. Glory to God. Now, the Holy Spirit is still absent, except he performed the deed between God and you to cause your spirit to be reborn in the image of Christ Jesus. And another thing, too, when you received salvation, you received it in your spirit body. See, Paul said there is a physical body and there's a spirit body. Well, your spirit body is all spirit. It has spirit substance. And so the spirit is what got born again. Your body did not get born again. It will never be anything but a rebel. It is not supposed, it's not subject, the scripture said, not subject to the law of God, indeed cannot be. So that's why Paul said, I keep my body under, lest while I preach to others, I myself might become a castaway. And so Paul was always in jeopardy of doing the wrong thing, not to lose his salvation, but to lose his testimony and lose his position and lose his ability to deal with the enemy. And so he was saying, I have to keep my body under control. So the body didn't get born again. Your mind didn't get born again because in James chapter 1, the Lord said for us to receive the engrafted word which is able to save or salvage your thinking, your soul, the man, the thinking man. Glory to God. So what spirit was sent to you in the new birth? The spirit of his son, Jesus. Glory to God. Now that's, it's a plain teaching of God. You can, you can add things to it or take things from it, but I wouldn't advise it. To me, it's just plain as the nose on your face. Glory to face. Now, uh, that being said, I want you to go back to St. John 14 for just a minute. Glory to God. And I want you to see this. <clears throat> Chapter 14 and verse 10. 1410, St. John. Believest thou not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? Jesus speaking. The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwells in me, he doeth the works. Believe me, I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. And then he makes another statement. It's profound for the average Christian when they hear this, verse 12. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believes on me, you believe on Jesus? Praise God. The works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works than these. That means greater in number because there's more of us. Greater works than these shall he do because I go to my Father. Now the reason God is saying he'll do greater works than me because I'm going to go to my Father. Now Jesus hasn't been crucified here yet. So nobody could be really born again at this time. They could become believers under the law. Jesus was a rabbi under the law. He was, Jesus was not a Christian. Christians were first talked about in the book of Acts. He was not a Christian. He was going to bring the kingdom of God to men. And the church had not been established yet. Jesus said to Peter, upon this rock of revelation, I will build my church. Not that I have built it, but I will build it. And he will. Now, notice very simply, the Lord said, the works that I do, shall you do also and greater works than these shall you do because I go to my Father. Well, what's the purpose of him going to the Father? Well, listen to this in verse 16, same chapter. I will pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter, one in my place, that he may abide with you forever. Well, the comforter here is the paraclete, one called alongside to help to take Get to hold together with against a little kind of a tongue tire, but it means a helper, a helper. Verse 17, even the spirit of truth, but notice here, whom the world cannot receive. 
the world can't receive the Holy Spirit because it sees him not, neither knows him, but you know him for he dwells with you. And he's talking to his disciples here now. He said the Holy Spirit dwells with you and he shall be, future tense, in you. So at the time that Jesus walked the earth, he was the only one that possessed the Holy Spirit. And he was because his spirit was already divine. His spirit was already belonged to God. Ours did not. There was no birth, a rebirth of the spirit at this time, not until Jesus had made the first transition. He was the first begotten from the dead because he who knew no sin became sin with our sin and he had to go into hell and pay your price and my price and for three days and three nights he was in the bowels of the earth accomplishing just that. And then he rose in triumphant glory, bringing to us the keys of hell and death to the church. And he's going to empower that church. But he told his disciples, if you recall, in the book of Acts, we'll read that in a few moments. He said, don't do anything right now. After he'd risen from the dead, he spent 40 days talking to his disciples about the kingdom of God. And he was telling them how it worked. He was telling them what part they have in it. But they didn't have the part in it yet. Now, they were believers. So being believers and, and walking with Jesus and seeing him face to face and believing the resurrection, then they completed the New Testament gospel in that they believed and their spirits were reborn, but they still lacked one thing he said you do not have, and that is the comforter, the paraclete. Now, my Father and I dwell in you because now you're believers and your spirit has been rebirthed, but you cannot receive the Holy Spirit until the time. Now, remember what we're talking about today, patterns and instructions and even time. And so he said, the works that I do shall you do also because I go to my Father. Well, what was he going to the Father for? Very simply this. He was going to create in us the ability to receive the Holy Spirit. Matthew chapter 3. Go there with me. Matthew chapter 3. We're covering it pretty fast today, so stay with me. We'll do the best we can. And what you need to do is make sure that you get the word jotted down, all these different scriptures. This is Matthew chapter 3. And if you'll remember, Jesus was 30 years old. When this incident happened, and, and let me read it to you, and then we'll discuss it a little bit. Glory to God. Matthew chapter 3, beginning in verse 11. Let's begin to read there. I indeed baptize you with water. And this is John the Baptist speaking when he's baptizing at the Jordan River. Now remember, who is he and what's he doing there? Well, he's the son of Zacharias, who was the high priest. And now he is carrying the anointing of priesthood under Jewish law. And it is imperative, if you remember, we read over in, in Exodus and Genesis, we read about how man's created, and in Exodus, how God said, here's what you're going to do. So he told Moses, I want you to set me up a priesthood. Take Aaron and his, five son, Aaron and his, and his sons, that'd be five people. And so five is the number of grace. Well, you have a corresponding uh, ministry in the New Testament and the Lord said that there we have apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher, five. Same as the Old Testament started with, but that was under Jewish law because no one could be born again yet. Jesus had not come and made that first transition. He was the first begotten from the dead. Everyone else will have to be after him. Glory to God. Now, it says here in, in chapter 3 of, of Matthew, once again, verse 11, I indeed baptize you with water under repentance. That's John the Baptist speaking. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And so the baptizer in the Holy Spirit is Jesus. And unless you possess him, you don't have any access to this Holy Spirit baptism. Once you do have him, once the rebirth has occurred of your human spirit, then you're capable of receiving the third person of the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. You're capable of receiving him 
then. And you receive him directly from Jesus according to John's instruction, according to the pattern. Jesus is our pattern in the New Testament. I don't think anyone will disagree with that. Jesus is our pattern. Verse 12. Whose fan is in his hand, he will thoroughly purge his floor, gather his wheat into the garner. He will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Verse 13. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. Well, why? Because Moses originated the washing of the, of the, those in the priesthood under the law. And he did this because they were in desert and he did it with what they would call a washing. Actually, we would call it a baptizing, water baptizing. And then John, he, he saw Jesus come and he said, I don't know who this is, but Jesus said, I need to be baptized of you. Well, why did Jesus need to be baptized of anyone? Because he was going into the office of a rabbi. He wasn't going to be a preacher. He wasn't going to be a New Testament preacher. There was no New Testament. What he was going to do is fulfill the law he came to fulfill, and he had to minister as a rabbi under the law. And so John was the high priest under the law. Now remember, there was a high priest over in Jerusalem named Caiaphas, but Caiaphas was a corrupted priesthood because Rome had appointed him, not God. And so there was no anointing over in the temple that, that the, the Jews were worshiping at and that Caiaphas was reigning over. But John, the baptizer, was down on the Jordan River doing what God called him to do. And so Jesus had to go to John because that's where the anointing would be applied to Jesus when he was baptized of St. John. Because St. John, or well, not St. John, but John the, the Revelator is, uh, is the one who wrote first, second, third John, and Revelation. But this is John the Immerser. Now, it said here in verse 14, Jesus came and said, I need to be baptized of you. Verse 14, but John forbid him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and he comest thou to me. Verse 15, and Jesus answered and said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becomes us to fulfill all righteousness. What's he talking about? Fulfill the righteousness of the law. They were under the law. Then he allowed him or suffered him. Verse 16. Now notice what happens with Jesus. Notice something drastic happens right at this point. Not because of the water. Not because of uh, John the baptizer. But because of compliance with the pattern. Compliance with the pattern and the instruction of God that he gave Moses so many centuries before. And now Jesus is complying with the pattern and complying with the instructions. Verse 16. Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straight away out of the water. And lo, the heavens were open and unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God. That's the Holy Spirit. Descending like a dove. And it lighting upon him. So here he receives water baptism according to the Mosaic law for those who are going to enter into the ministry, the rabbinical priesthood. And also he is baptized from heaven with the Holy Spirit. Verse 17. And Lord voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I will please. So here we have Jesus not only being baptized in obedience to Jewish law and tradition, but also becoming a rabbi at about 30 years of age, and you had to be 30 to become a rabbi, and also he received the Holy Spirit of God. Now, if he has to receive the Holy Spirit of God, being a son of God, certainly you being a born-again believer should have to receive the Holy Spirit the same way the pattern shows us. Not necessarily that you receive the Holy Spirit at the baptismal, because the baptismal for the new believer, the Christian, is not the same as it was under the law. Because under the law, the only way you could become a rabbi was for the high priest to wash you, give you a washing, ceremonial washing. And there, thereby, the anointing would come on you to serve God in that capacity had you been called to it. Jesus was, and he did what the law required him to do under Jewish law. <clears throat> and 
he was baptized in water when he came up the holy spirit of god came upon him and from that time on he began to preach the kingdom of god not the church the kingdom of god now this may be say a little alien to you but i want you to go with me now to uh let's go to chapter four matthew chapter four and look at verse 17 here it is i want you to read this from the time Jesus began to preach and to say, from that time, which time was it? When he was baptized in the, in, and also after his temptation of the devil, after he had come from this baptizing and the receiving of the Holy Spirit, where God said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Then after that, it says he was tempted 40 days and 40 nights of the devil, and he successfully defeated that. But in verse 17 of chapter 4 of Matthew, verse 17, it says, From that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He didn't preach the church. He preached the kingdom of heaven because he's talking to Jews. He's not talking to the Gentiles. Glory to God. Now in Luke 10, Luke chapter 10, I know we're, we're covering a lot of scripture here, but please jot them down. They're very important to you to make all of these pieces fit properly. And in many people's theology, the pieces just don't fit. So be sure you stick it out. If you got a question, uh, you be sure and ask. Uh, if you don't belong to New Life Fellowship Church, uh, we'd invite you to come visit with us when we were once again able to assemble as a group. And as I said before, the, side, the guidelines given by our governor uh, for for medically for medical reasons is probably very appropriate, but for a church it's impossible because our musicians can't play their instruments with a mask on. I can't lead any music with a mask on. I can't speak to you out of the Bible with a mask on, and you can't sit every other pew six feet apart because <laughs> auditorium just. Won't, it won't accommodate very many people like that. So it's just an impossible situation. And so until that's changed, we're going we're gonna to do our best to obey the laws given to us by our leaders for they, they, they believe they're doing the best thing and they're just men. You understand? They can miss it. But they're doing the best they can. So let's just cooperate with them and don't be hard to them. Don't criticize. Yeah, aren't you glad you're not having to make these decisions? I'm glad I'm not. Glory to God. So anyway, I'd rather be obedient and be wrong than to be disobedient and be wrong. Glory to God. Now in Luke chapter 10, go over there with me in verse 1. After these things, the Lord appointed, now this is after Jesus has been crucified, buried, risen again, and, and of course after his baptism in, under the apostle John, or the baptizer John, and also that the Holy Spirit came upon him. It says in chapter 10 of Luke, verse 1, After these things the Lord appointed other 72. See, so he had chosen people to go with him. And he sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself would come. Therefore he said, verse 2, Unto them the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. Go your way. Behold, I send you forth his lambs among wolves. Carry neither the person of script. So he told him, you go on faith. I want you to go. Now I realize the Holy Spirit of God came up on them. Not in them, because they're not born again. Jesus is the only one who had the Holy Spirit of God in him. And in this particular type, he was already a son of God. He had been a divine man all his life. And he was under the power of the Holy Spirit. And so he said for them to, to do these things. In verse 8, same chapter 10, verse 8. Under whatsoever city you enter, they receive you. Eat such things as set before you. Heal their sick that are therein. Say unto them, the kingdom of God has come nigh unto you. And so... Jesus is sending people forth to do the works of the new birth, even under the power of the Holy Spirit. Why is that? Because when you are born again, 
You got to receive, you receive from God some very precious anointing and things, but there's no power in them to affect change in others. You received love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, meekness, faith, and temperance. Well, there's wonderful attributes, and they're, they're moral absolutes, but they are not powerful. Now, under the Holy Spirit, and I'll read you that if we have time to get to it today, but if not, you can read it for yourself in Ephesians 6, and you can also read it for yourself in the armor of God. But think about this. Think about this. Words of wisdom and words of knowledge are not because you read and studied Words of wisdom is knowing something that you couldn't possibly know without revelation. That's what God said about uh, Peter when Peter said, flesh and blood has not revealed this to me. That's what Jesus told him about what he had said about who he was, who Jesus was. He said, thou art art the Son of God, the risen Christ. He didn't say risen Christ because he hadn't been risen yet. But he did say, thou art the Son of God. Jesus said, Thou art Peter upon this rock. A little play on words. Peter means stone. Upon this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You know what authority he just said over the church? Do you realize how much authority the church has? Over everything in the earth the church has authority. Is it exercising that authority as we speak? No. It is being timid and backward and mixed up. Why? The devil joined the church instead of trying to crucify and instead of trying to kill all those who swore allegiance to this Jesus Christ, instead of trying to martyr them, the more he martyred, the more believed. And so the devil decided to join the church, pollute the God doctrine, pollute the church, and it's been working for years. Church, go back to the word of God and straighten out the theology, straighten out your thinking because you have the authority to change things. God gave you that authority when Jesus paid the price for your deliverance. Glory to God. So he said, heal their sick and say unto them, the kingdom of God's come nigh you. Heal the sick. Uh, some people say, well, the healing passed away to the last apostle. That's not even close to true. The same spirits in the earth now that was here when he, Jesus told them to do this. It's the same spirit that does the same work because it's miracles and healings that come with the Holy Spirit. Not when you're born again, spirit. And God never asked you to heal anybody. He said, you go lay your hands on them. I'll do the healing. You don't have to. So Christian, get bold about it. Lay your hands on people. Believe in God. Not believing you. God never just told you to heal anybody. Now he says this. <clears throat> in verse 17. And the 70 returned. Again with joy. Saying, Lord, even the devils are subject to us through thy name. So they're able to cast out the devil. Hallelujah. That means authority over the devil. It's authority over Satan. All the powers of darkness you have, that authority has already been given to you. These people weren't born again. They just had the Holy Spirit traveling with them, but not in them. You who are baptized in the Holy Spirit have the Holy Spirit living within you. The most powerful individual on the face of the earth lives within the vessel that God prepared for a three-room house for him to live in. Your spirit, your soul, and your body. Glory to God. Verse 18, Jesus said, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Verse 19, then he says this to them, Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions. These are not, these are not pests. These are not small creatures. These are representative of the powers of darkness, demons, devils. All the kinds of things that the devil has loosed into the earth. You have power to tread on them. That means put them under your feet. Tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power. The word power here can be interpreted force or power or anointing. Under the dunamis of power. Over all the power of the enemy, all the power, not anything omitted. The devil's never been anything like powerful to you except in deception. He deceives the church. 
They can't do this. They can't pray for the sick. And when they do pray, they can't get people healed because they're not supposed to be their healer. They're supposed to be their prayer. And they're believing in the word of God and believe what God said about if you lay hands on the sick, they will recover. Not because you did it, but because I did it. Glory to God. Point things to God. Point those, uh, those successes and those healings and those wonders. Point them to God, not you. Because you're just the pipe through which the power flows. The power is God working through the believer. Glory to God. And he said, all power, I give you power over serpents, scorpions, and all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Notwithstanding in this, sub rejoice not that your spirits are subject unto you. The spirits are subject, talking about evil spirits. But rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Glory to God. I think that's something we ought to all rejoice over. Our name is written down in glory. Now, uh, I want you to go with me from Luke uh, chapter 10 in Acts chapter 1. Let's go over there. Acts chapter 1. Now, the church at the time of Jesus was not empowered. The church didn't exist. There was an assembly, but these were saints of the Old Testament without the rebirth. But then listen to this. Jesus has been crucified, buried, and risen again, and here is a record of what he did after he had been raised from the dead in, in the Acts of the Apostles. Verse 1 of Acts chapter 1, The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day in which he was taken up after he through the Holy Ghost had given commandment unto the apostles whom he had chosen. Verse 3, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days. And speaking of the things pertaining to the church, no, no, read it, the kingdom of God. There is no church at this time. Verse 4, and being assembled together with them, commanded them they should not depart from, Israel, from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, you've heard of me. For John, verse 5, truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Well, see, they could have received the Holy Ghost at any time except for one thing. Everything has to be done according to the pattern, according to instruction. Now, in Leviticus 23, we have the seven feasts of the Lord. Those seven feasts, Jesus played them all out in their proper sequence and their proper pattern. He was crucified on Passover, buried on unleavened bread. Now, these are the feasts of Israel. These are the feasts of God. And they are not a place where you have a, a little hammer and a hot dog. It is a place of observation as a sign, as a signal. Jesus was crucified on Passover, you recall. He was buried the very next day, unleavened bread. Three days later, raised from the earth, that's first fruits, not Easter, but first fruits. And then 50 days later, sent the Holy Spirit. Pentecost means 50. And so Jesus told his disciples here, he spent 40 days with them. So with evidently they had to stay a, a portion of 10 days in this place waiting for the proper pattern and instructions to be fulfilled for the baptism in the Holy Spirit. He said, you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost, not many days hence. Then, of course, they ask him about, are you going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Because they had the idea of some political solution to their problem under Rome, because they were under Roman domination. Jesus was too. As a matter of fact, Roman soldiers are the ones who crucified him at the orders of the religious Jews. Glory to God. Verse 8, very important verse here. Watch it closely. Be sure and then get your Bible or jot down these scriptures and go back and read and study them. Verse 8, but you, talking to his disciples now, the one that had been following him, you shall receive power, dunamis, after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Now, dunamis means power, that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. He is the anointer of power. 
Now, I told you before, when you get born again, you have love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, meekness, faith, and temperance. Those are wonderful things, but they're moral. But the Holy Spirit has words of wisdom, words of knowledge, miracles, healings, all of the things that have to do with power. But look what it says here. You be witnesses unto me. What does that mean? Well, it means simply that the things that I do shall you do also in greater works than these because I go to my Father. So that's why the disciples could go and heal and cast out devils and so forth. It took them a while to learn how to do it and to do it perfectly, but they did. And he gave that same power to the church. In chapter 2 here, we're going to read where it says this in verse chapter 2, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost... Remember, Pentecost was 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus. He spent 40 days with them, and, and they had a portion of that time. They had to go to the upper room in Jerusalem and wait for the promise of the Father. What was the promise? The power, spirit, the Holy Ghost given to the church. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one accord in one place. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, it sat on each of them, and they all were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Filling with the Holy Spirit is accompanied by speaking in tongues always. Always. Now, some people block it with their mind. They may ask to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, but they will not let it come out their mouth because it doesn't come out of your intellect. It comes out of your belly because the Lord said, out of your belly will flow those living waters. Well, your spirit is, is related to what God called the belly, the inner man. And so it says here, now this is the pattern. This is the instruction. Jesus is our prototype. However he did it is the way we're supposed to do it. However these early disciples and apostles did it, we're supposed to follow that pattern. It has never passed away and it never will. The last apostle dying did not remove the Holy Spirit from the earth and did not remove God's instruction to the New, New Testament believer. So listen to this again. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Well, there's a lot of controversy in the body of Christ. A lot of people say, well, I just don't believe in this tongues business. Well, then you don't believe what God said. It's that simple. And if you say, well, I don't understand it, but God said it, so I believe it. Then you've got the idea right. God can straighten out wrong thinking. Now, you're going to find here uh, about different groups. And it says here, and they, we hear every man in our own tongue. Verse 8. Wherein we were born. Parthians, Medes, Elamites, dwellers in Mesopotamia. Where did all these people come from? Well, they're in Jerusalem because it's a high holy day. It's a high holy day. It's Pentecost. It is the feast of the Jews. The feast of, of the Pentecost. The 50-day feast after the resurrection of Jesus. So they're all there for religious reasons. They're vendors. They have things to sell to the Jews, religious artifacts and items and so forth. And so it's a big day there for them, and it's important that you understand why they're all there. But then when they get there, they hear these people speak in other tongues, and they're hearing them speak in their own language. And these people couldn't speak anything but their own native language before that time. But now under the Holy Ghost, and the Holy Spirit speaks every language on the earth in languages that we may have long since that may have long since died. The Holy Spirit provided him this. Now, you may say, well, what good is it? Because there's people that, you know, speak in other tongues. What good is all of that? Glory to God. Then in, in verse 33 of that same chapter, read this. Verse 33 of Acts chapter 2. Therefore, being by the right hand of God and exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed for this, which you now see and hear. That shedding forth of the Holy Ghost was given by God, and it remains today just as much in force as it did in this day here. Glory to God. We have in progress, we have regressed, church, and we need to admit it. Now, chapter 19, while we're in the book of Acts, chapter 19, let me show you something here. Chapter 19. Paul, I'm... Gradually running out of time, so just forgive me. <clears throat> Paul, 
Paul was in Apollos, uh, he was at, uh, Paul and Apollos was in Corinth. Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples. Now, these are people who are born again. He said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? They said unto him, We've not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what were you baptized? And they said, John's baptism, the one under the law, the baptism in water under John the Immerser, John the Baptizer. Verse 4, Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying, Under the people they should believe on him, which should come after him, that is, on Christ. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. So the arrival of the Holy Spirit in a believer will always wind up being the time he speaks in other tongues. Glory to God. Now, I want you to go, that was, that was 20 years after what happened in Acts chapter 2. So it didn't go away. And all the disciples, I'm sure, probably, probably passed on by this time. They were all martyred. And so the reason for that, and I want you to see this because it's important. Go with me over to Ephesians chapter 6. And I'm running out of time. Please forgive me, saints. I, I didn't get it done like I wanted to. But I'll get it done as I can. Hallelujah. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being with us. And thank you for listening. And I hope you'll look up all of these scriptures and see that what God has placed in the church is still there. We haven't missed anything except our theology has been bent. Glory to God. Now I want you to notice in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, and against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Well, then this wrestling results in something, and so we put on the whole armor of God. You'll find that listed uh, read if you read further on. The armor of God. But look what it says in verse 17. Very pointed here. Take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always all with all prayer, intended this would say all kinds of prayer. There are nine kinds. We'll teach on that at a feaster time. And supplication in the Spirit. Well, what is praying in the Spirit? 1 Corinthians 14. 1 Corinthians 14. Look what it says here. Verse 14 of 1 Corinthians 14. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. What is it then? I will pray with the Spirit when I don't know exactly what to pray. Holy Spirit God, help with our infirmities with groanings which cannot be uttered in articulate speech. I will pray with the understanding also, and I will sing with the Spirit. I will also sing with the understanding also. Now this is because the Lord told us in verse 1 of this same chapter, follow after charity, desire spiritual gift, but rather that you may prophesy, for he that speaks in an unknown tongue speaks not unto him to men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, howbeit in the Spirit he speaks mysteries. Glory to God. Mysteries. Speaking in other tongues is of God. Now let me show you something. I hope we can get this. June, Jude, verse 17. Just before Revelation, you find Jude, verse 17. I'll get this in. But, beloved, beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. How you told it to be mockers in the last time, we should walk after their own lust. These be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the Spirit. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves in the most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. That means praying in tongues. Glory to God. So it's meant for us. And this, this whole book was completed in the first century, Revelation being completed somewhere around 96 A.D. And so the whole book was 16 different authors, 40, uh, 42 different authors in 1,600 years. Let me get that straight. All of this has not changed, beloved. It's the same book. It's the same God. It's the same Holy Spirit. But if I were the devil, the thing I would do is join the church and nullify what's so powerful against me and bring it to naught and teach people that there's nothing to it so that I could overcome them, even believers. Glory to God. 
Church, God bless you. I just pray over you and plead the blood of Jesus over you. Every household represented here, whether you belong to this church or not, you belong to the Lord, you belong to us, and we belong to you. If you have an opportunity when we begin to meet again, 816 North Main, Gladewater, Texas, love to see you. We're in our school facilities recording this, and so just all I can say, church, is God bless you. I miss you. want to hug your neck, and of course, we're going to comply with what we've been asked to do. God bless. God bless you.